we have a, like a small confession to make. And um, it's really that arc is slow in a lot of places. So I really want to just take some time and walk you through, you know, some of this stuff and really, you know, apologize about we didn't realize Arc is kind of escaping our trusted little circle of M1 machines. And, you know, now that we understand from a lot of our members that they're experiencing issues and for them, Arc is slow. And, you know, Arc can feel like this car sometimes. It can feel enjoyable and cute and fun, but also like not really getting you where you need to go. And that's a huge problem. And you can take a look at some of these fixes we made along the way as like small admissions of, is of issues we found that could make your life a lot better if you're, you know, in, you know, not using an M1 machine. So we were actually using like an unbounded amount of memory. If you were looking at all the archive snapshots, you know, you open up the archive, you scroll through, maybe you were using gigabytes of your memory and we shouldn't do that. And we were also engaging in AppNap and generally AppNap's a good thing, but for the way that we process events, it's actually a bad thing. And if you left Arc for a while and came back to it, it would just be frozen sometimes and that sucks. Um, but also we were keeping a lot of things that we, you know, were off screen. We were still processing their events. We shouldn't have done that. And, you know, there's so many more things, but I would love to take you through like a small amount of work that we've been doing um, more recently just to understand this performance stuff a bit in depth. Uh, but anyway, hi, I'm Brian. I'm an engineering manager here at the browser company. Uh, prior to living a life of browsers, I was building a number of apps for different companies like Cash App and Tumblr and Twitter and uh, food, <laughs> food delivery app called Ondo that was very short lived, but very delicious. Um, but the interesting thing about all of these applications, and you can kind of see it here from these screenshots, right? Like they have a, f a really desired flow or a desired screen that they're trying to keep you in and trying to you know, make it more useful for you or make, it, make these couple of actions more useful. And in Cash, it's kind of you know, sending money. The sending money flow is really important to Cash App. Um, it's what most people do when they open the application. For Twitter, it's the home timeline. Scrolling through this home timeline is something that everyone does. And on a mobile app, your session life is about, you know, measured in, in minutes and maybe tens of minutes if you're lucky. But in general, you're kind of on this linear kind of like, uh, you know, one screen to another screen to another screen to another screen sort of thing. On a desktop application, all of those constraints are out of the window for the most part, if you want them to be. You can certainly build something like that, but you don't really have as much control or known constraints that you do, like, like you do on a mobile application. So you could have, you know, 20 windows open in a Mac OS application. Someone could be launching your app from Apple Script. They could be launching your app from the command line. They could be passing in flags and looking at the file structure of things you save on disk. And those are all things that for me, and this is my first Mac OS app in earnest, um, other than like stupid little apps I've made for myself, it's kind of, eye-opening to understand that there's so much going on and so much freedom that people have when using Mac and desktop applications in general that, you know, we need to be aware of a totally different kind of uh, set of issues that don't really exist or exist for some apps um, on iOS, but, you know, are really just, you know, kind of niche. Um, so I want to talk about performance as we started kind of like mentioning earlier. And performance is a lot like plumbing, in my opinion. When plumbing is working properly without any issues, no one's talking about it. And that's probably how plumbing should be. I guess if you're, if you're a plumber, you're probably always talking about plumbing. Um, so like that's obviously totally fine. But for regular people, you just want to make sure it works. And when it doesn't work, that's when the conversation really starts to come to the front about, hey, why is it like this? How come it is like this? What, why can't we go back to the way it used to be? Um, and I think this is really fascinating because... I think performance is one of those things that actually drives connection with a lot of experiences. Um, when, you when you're not thinking about performance, that means that an application is doing its job. It's functioning correctly, and it's kind of creating almost like this extension of yourself. So, you know, you're, you're just using this thing really peacefully and really happily. But as soon as performance starts at a grade, excuse me, in some features that you use, you start really noticing and thinking and second guessing and kind of wondering what's going on. And you break this perception of what's happening. And I, I want to talk a little bit about this kind of like extension of self that I think performance enables, because I think it's something that's really fascinating. And 
the couple of things that came to mind for me personally is like when I got an iPhone for the first time and I use it. And you can see here kind of like, you know, this uh, interesting kind of rubber banding effect that Apple and iOS and is really well known for these days. But when it first came out, it was revolutionary. No one had ever shipped, you know, a capacitive touchscreen before. And this kind of interaction and Apple kind of doing their job and making really performant code in this case made it feel kind of like I wasn't using an iPhone. I was just directly manipulating this list on this kind of glass brick, um, which was really, really cool. And I didn't think I'm, you know, moving my finger to touch the screen, to move this, you know, to tell this piece of hardware to move this list. And I'm just moving this list. It wasn't complicated. It was what I had to think about it. Um, and the same thing goes for bikes. This isn't my bike, but I have a bike kind of similar to this. Um, but when you kind of have your transmission on a bike dialed in, it just feels like perfection. You don't think about it when you're riding, you're just riding a bike. You're not moving the transmission or worrying about your chain or you're kind of worrying if you need to oil your chain or something like that. If you have enough tension in the chain, it just works and it feels awesome. And performance, in my opinion, underlies all of those things and it really connects it to its digital experience because it's something that we can talk about in a quantitative way if we want to. And so that's what we're going to do. But I wanna talk about how we perceive performance, at least in like the digital world for you know, a lot of things. So we're gonna talk about kind of just input delay as like a proxy for, for perception and performance here. I found this cool website that lets you kind of type and it introduces delay into as you type, you can understand how bad it could feel for someone. And so right now it's just at five milliseconds, which is you know pretty fast. Um, I would say very fast actually. So you can just type and it feels great. It feels exactly like I'm typing on the keyboard. I see the character show up on my screen. No connection is broken there, um, which is really, really fun. And I, I think this is a great representation because if you clear this out and we set, you know, 200 milliseconds. So this is still, you know, well under half of a second. So if you start typing, you can see how bad it is. And you can see that as I enter the keyboard, if you can hear it, I'm typing on the keyboard and it's slowly catching up. And it's catching up, you know, after I type the keyboard, I'm getting ahead of it. So I'm now asking myself, oh, should I slow down? Should I stop typing entirely? Is something wrong? Should I restart my computer? Should I do this thing? Your mind kind of starts spinning of potential solutions for this because we're not that patient. I mean, we want to get our job done. We want to do what we're trying to do. So performance is underlying all of this. And the number that you'll hear us talking about a lot of time is 16 milliseconds. And the reason we think about 16 milliseconds for a lot of the actions that we want to perform in ARC for you is because this is the amount of time that we have to run our code in between, say, clicking a button or dragging something or anything like that that you interact with. And 16 milliseconds is effectively one frame in a 60, 60 hertz refresh rate. And 60 hertz is the refresh rate of many displays, although we're seeing many more modern displays uh, operate at 120 hertz. So they're twice as fast, meaning that we only actually have uh, eight milliseconds ish to do all, all of our jobs. Um, so this is kind of an interesting thing that we have to keep mindful of. And it's just a useful number to kind of keep in the back of your head as you're thinking about performance. Well, let's flip back. Um, that all sounds great. Thank you for the history lesson and the theory, but let's talk about some actual real world performance data. So uh, let's see if I can load this. Cool. So this is one of our, our, our suite of tests that we run, and it's all about performance. It's all about kind of real world performance of taking actions inside of our application. Uh, this is for clearing unpinned tabs. So what that means is like when you click this clear button over here, there we go, big mouse time. Um, we clear all the tabs that are unpinned and you can pin tabs and keep them around if you kind of drag them up here, if you use the keyboard shortcuts. But when we started, embarking on this kind of performance journey, I'll call it, you can see here clearing all, clearing pin tabs was taking about like 61 milliseconds, um, which is, you know, in a vacuum, not a, not a bad number at all. But now that we've talked about that kind of magical number of 16 milliseconds or below, and ideally much further below, you can see that this is actually pretty far off from where we want to kind of keep that 
perception of arc feeling like an extension of yourself. So you can see here, there's like this kind of like journey down and kind of go back up and it's a little meandering, but if you look at, let's see, what is this? The 11th, a couple of days ago with the last run, you know, we're under that threshold now. We're at 13 milliseconds uh, for this action to complete. So this, we've kind of reestablished that continued understanding of like, this is just an, arc is just an extension of yourself. It's doing exactly what you ask of it. And you don't have to think about it. You don't have to set and guess it, which is really, really cool. And what's fascinating about this is that if you look at, you know, this, if you're wondering what this blank section is over here, we actually didn't have these tests, but when we first started looking at performance, so we would hear all these reports from, from members like yourselves and, you know, we didn't have data to look at to understand and quantify this problem. So we had to write these tests that are getting the data in a controlled way because we wanted to make sure that we could understand performance in a controlled kind of environment. And then we could start making improvements and measure them in a controlled way. And as you can see, you know, as we've established these tests, we've been able to drive down the performance of this or drive up the performance, drive down the milliseconds that we're taking to do this work, which I think is a really kind of core principle for how we think about this performance stuff is you got to be able to measure it if you're going to actually change it. And that's true with a lot of things. So this is just one of many tests that we have, but you know, there are still parts that are very slow on some of these machines that we have to be conscious of, we have to understand more about. So as we get more feedback from members, we are kind of digging into all these various places more and more to make it better for, and make art fast for everyone. So let's kind of flip back for a second. So this is those tests I just showed you, we run those before we ship a release to members, but we also have this entire set of questions like, well, what happens after it gets shipped to members? What can we do after it goes out? And can we understand how someone on maybe a MacBook Air is performing compared to, you know, a new Mac Studio, which, you know, are, are wildly different performance profiles. So we built this sampled anonymous performance tracing framework that allows us to look at a segment of members in an anonymized fashion of like, what's their call stack like, and what's the amount of time that each of these calls is taking inside of our application. So you can kind of look here and see that, you know, one of these actions is taking like 260 some milliseconds, which is, is maybe okay. But what's fascinating is that all of these calls are comprised by other calls inside of them, right? There's this kind of like waterfall of, of calls that get made um, inside the application to various functions and methods trying to do the work that needs to be done inside of the application. And for the most part, they're kind of, you know, they're big here, but then they get kind of smaller and they all sort of line up next to each other. But you can see some bigger ones here. So you can look at something like this and this, and you're kind of wondering, oh, those things kind of stick out to me. I wonder what's going on there. And that's exactly the kind of conversation that prompts us to say, oh, this looks like it might be slow for people. Let's go ahead and dive into what actually is happening there so we can make it a bit better. So this is a really fascinating thing that I actually had never used before or understood before. So I'm really pumped that the team was able to build something like this because it is so, so, so useful for us to understand all these different hardware profiles that are, have, are being used in production and how we can actually you know, understand more of them. So that's not all. We've shipped a number of fixes that I mentioned kind of before, and we're continuing to make more fixes. We also, you know, just to call out a couple things, we talked about kind of like that memory usage, but also we did a bunch of work around batching information coming from Chromium as you're rendering a website back into our other part, other part of our code base and before we weren't batching any of these. So they were just kind of like all coming in and causing a lot of work to be done. Now we batch them. So it makes everything kind of smoother. It makes scrolling a bit smoother. It makes loading, going backwards, going forward a little smoother. It makes syncing a little smoother because this is one application. It's a complex system inside. So there's a lot of things that are interrelated or depend on each other to, to be fast. And when one thing is not fast, that means that other things can become not fast as well. Um, there were some memory leaks that we fixed. We've made the command bar typing experience 6% faster overall. Um, we've looked through you know, fuzzy matching algorithms to make you know, command bar faster there as well. We've also made a bunch of improvements around word tokenization for type travel queries. And if, if you don't know what type travel is, it's basically when you go to something, we open the command bar and you type like preferences and you see these two options down at the bottom. These are actually actions inside of Arc and this is a type travel action, meaning like it's not going to take you to a web page per se, but it's going to take some action to, you know, 
open the preferences window for you or something like that. We have tons of type travel actions all throughout the application. We have tons of shortcuts. So all of these things can you know, make things slower if someone is engaging with them more since we need to rank them and try to understand like, oh, is Brian looking for, you know, the general preferences kind of uh, type travel action or is he looking for preferences on a website that might be loaded? So there's tons of things like that that we have done, but also there is a mountain of work in front of us to keep working on performance changes as well as improving battery life and all of that good stuff. But we are going to continue working on it and I couldn't say any of this work was possible without this awesome team of you know andre and andrew and christoph and stefan and vivek and peter and hirsch and, and so many more people but it's been really lovely to get to work together with everyone and we are super excited about what we can send you next time and you know keep your eyes peeled for updates because we are going to keep focusing on performance we are not done yet so i'll talk to you later see ya